Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, okay. Why in that slide I have a paper in here? What the hell is that? <laughs> so, so I fold a lot of paper, basically. This is an early piece of mine. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work and where it came from and some of the processes that I used to make my work. Um, I teach at the University of Michigan, I teach at an art school, I also teach in the Lloyd Hall Scholars Program, I teach a class in paper engineering this semester. Um, you can come see my students' work tomorrow at the Best of Fools Parade. They've made some gigantic pleated paper <laughs> monsters. Um, I teach at Washington Community College, and I'm also a visiting research scholar at the Material Science uh, Department up on our campus, work with engineers. Um, let me start at the beginning. Uh, in 2002, I graduated from Alfred University, and I originally went to Alfred University for ceramics. It's New York State School of Ceramics. Um, and in the four years I was there, I took classes in everything. I realized I was a curious person. I wanted to do everything. I did glass blowing, I did ceramics, I did video performance. And by the time I graduated, I had a dual major, uh, both ceramics and print. And I didn't do any traditional ceramic or print work. Instead, I was making work like this. This is a large scale print. It's not quite as large here, but it is about five or six feet. Um, we had access to these phenomenal printers, these design liner and G clay printers. And I used to get up very early in the morning and sign my name on the, on the sheet, sign up sheet and use them. And I would make these large prints and then do a series of cut scores or creases into the backs of them to create these large uh, one-page pop-ups. And I really want to stress the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, uh, now I can look at this and say, well, that's a series of unequal V folds and I'm using a generational folding pattern. But at the time, I thought I was inventing this stuff. Um, I have a theory that when nothing is known, anything is possible, right? And so this willful ignorance, I didn't know what I was doing, I loved it. So I, I was in printmaking, I wanted to make work that was interactive, I didn't like this idea of two-dimensional work, it meant to be seen but not handled, I wanted my work to be interactive. So I was doing stuff like this, I would also do smaller, <laughs> this is nice to see large, it's about this big, smaller paper studies, <laughs> and I would dip them in porcelain, slip and fire them to comb tan, the paper would burn out, you get left with this sort of fossil. Um, this work is over a decade old, I still really don't know what it's about, but I'm curious about it. Um, I think if you could, if you had to pin me and say, what's the work about, I think it's about curiosity. I, I come to understanding in my work through making. Um, if I can see the final visual outcome or how I want it to look, I won't make it. I want to make something that I don't know how it's going to end up, how it's going to work. And I'm also going to mention a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you here, I have in reality, in a briefcase here. Uh, and afterwards, we can play with it and handle it, because I think seeing it on the screen and seeing it even moving isn't really how to understand this work. So I invite you after this talk to come up and play. Um, this is not my work. This is the work of Robert Zabuda. Zabuda is a uh, paper engineering guru of our time. If you go to Bar Borders or Barnes & Noble, there's a pop-up book section, but it's really the Robert Zabuda and Matthew Reinhardt section. And this was his uh, Alice in Wonderland book. This was his Wizard of Oz. And I would buy his books as an undergrad or people would buy them for me, and I would get two copies, and I would dissect one to figure out how it worked. And I would say the other as reference, because oftentimes I couldn't figure out how to get it to go back to the other. Um, I was a curious child. I liked taking things apart, and I think I still do. Um, and I wrote to Robert, and I said, listen, Zabuda, you've got to take me on. I want to be an apprentice. I want to be an intern. Teach me the way of paper. And you wrote me this great email back. I sent a bunch of images. He said, I think you're fantastic, but there's no way I'm going to teach you anything because it's all top secret. In the world of paper engineering, everybody's looking for a new fold, a new way of moving paper. He wasn't going to share. He does take apprentices now, but he didn't when I was uh, interested. He said, but there's a company in Connecticut called Structural Graphics, and you should talk to these guys. And they do paper engineering. And so I did. I sent them a portfolio. I graduated from undergrad on a Friday. I was home with my parents that weekend, which was plenty of time. Uh, and started work on Monday. Uh, and my mom is also streaming. Hi, Bernice. Uh, I love you. Uh, but I, I got a job. I was an art student. I had a job. Holy shit. <laughs> I was 21, I had a 401k plan, I had more office, I was living a life, right? I left that for three years. Um, I was making work like this. This is what we call an artist die drawing. I would figure out how these things collapse. This was for Disney. There was a sound chip in this, it probably played music. This was for, I don't know, something to show how strong this car was, it could pull a boat. Um, for cigarettes, I did a lot of table tent designs, um, a lot of car companies, a lot of software companies. This was for the Art Institute of Chicago, I did a lot of greeting cards for them. Um, every company thing, but I feel like I worked for them. This was uh, another greeting card. I want to make mention, in the world of paper engineering, everything is hand assembled. And so they want to make things as cheap to produce as possible and easy to assemble as possible. Uh, we had a plant in um, Texas where we would print and die cut, ship to Mexico, they hand assemble, we bring it back to the States and then distribute. 
So when you're working like this, you have to be mindful of hand assembly points. So if something has two folds, two loops, it means four hand assembly points, you can only make so many an hour. And they want to keep things simple. I'm an artist, I want to make things complex. Um, and so when I first made this one, there was a fourth ranger that flew in the background on the screen. They had a strut, and they took it out. It was, it was too much. I did a lot of designs like this. This is called the extendo mechanism. They still make a lot of these. These are things that hold DVDs or CDs. You pull something, and the CD pops out. On the other side, one, one of the jobs I did just before I left was, um, it was a four-disc set for the Passion of the Christ DVD holder, and it popped out like a cross. <laughs> I don't know if they ever produced it, and I'm really scared to go to like Target and see it and be like, should I buy it? I don't want, I don't want it, but... <laughs> uh, this was the largest job I did. This was for the Mini Cooper when it launched a few years ago. They made something like 15 million of these things. It's a little car, it's perforated, and you pop it out, you get your little Mini Cooper car. Um, it was one of the final jobs I did. Um, it won this Kelly Award, which is this $100,000 graphic design award, of which I saw nothing. Uh, Christian Porter, who was our ad agency, they got the money. And I kind of realized I kind of maxed out at this company. I wasn't necessarily interested in making things for cars or making things for, um, let's see if this works, making things for um, cigarette companies. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> right? I was interested in making stuff like this. And marketing would look at this and go, like, what is that, like 10,000 hand assembly points? <laughs> that sold cigarettes. Like, this isn't meant to sell cigarettes, right? This isn't meant to sell cars. I was interested in light and balance and form and everything that artists are interested in. Um, and I knew that the work was bigger than commercial design. Things like this, this is a modular unit study. I work with engineers now and they look at this and they're like, oh, it's a crystal line structure. And they understand this stuff in a whole different way than artists do. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, single sheet folds, what can I do with curve uh, cuts? Single sheets, again, these are really small, but they're nice to see really large. I tell my students, you're not the work, it's how you photograph the work, so you get real loud. This thing could be just ginormous. Right? Why couldn't this be made out of metal? It could be used to amplify sound, deflect sound, anything. Shell forms, single sheet folds. Again, not interested in commercial design so much. And I would make artist books, I would do things like this, and uh, when we get to work early, I should also mention this, we had these fantastic flatbed plotter cutters at Structural. And using AutoCAD, we would program whatever we want on the computer, hit a button, and print it, and it would cut it out for us, which was really nice. And so I did work about an hour before anyone would show up. They foolishly gave me a key. And I would work, and I would make my work, and I would hide it like under my desk or in my bar. And I would make artist books and things like this and sell them. Here's another artist book. And I have this stuff here. It's nice to see in a video, but it's, it's nice to actually play with. This is shot in the parking lot of Structural. Um, Minkos, who helped me with the main Cooper, designed the tabs, uh, shooting me here. Sharpie marker, pen, pencil, paintbrush, I can make it soft for me. 
whatever I want. Um, I love to collaborate. And so when I was at Cranbrook, I started writing people outside of art to see what I could use this work for. Uh, and I got in touch with the University of Michigan, this is sort of how I ended up here. Uh, I ended up giving a talk at the Macromolecular Science Department, which was great because I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and I was nervous about it, but then I thought, you know, they don't know what I do, so what difference does it make? And so I was presenting my work, showing some other things. And, um, and this one guy stood up in the back and he said, that's it, that's what I do. And I was showing an artist book that had, a, he called it a double cell membrane, but it was basically a book that looked tight around itself. And he said, I've been trying to illustrate how this, this, this thing called an autophagosome rotates around itself during cellular division. And I've been trying to explain it for 15 years, but my students don't understand how this thing moves, but I can see it in my head. And this book does what this thing should do. And I said, cool, you know? And so, <laughs> and we made them as, as a tool to help illustrate how this thing moves. And I started to realize that there was an amazing crossover between science and art. And it was something that in art school I'd never heard of, and it was something that the scientists had never really thought about how to, you know, uh, work back with us. And so now I'm a visiting research scholar in the material science department. I'm not, I haven't been terribly active within this past year. Um, visiting research scholar is a fancy word for saying volunteer. <laughs> um, so I work with a guy named Max Stein. Max's group uh, designs solar cells. They're interested in the flexible nature of solar cells. And if you look at how solar cells look today, if under a microscope, they're actually an array of four-sided pyramids. And the reason that they look like this, the surface, is that there's a great amount of surface area on the solar cell. And no matter where the sun is, it's always getting part of this surface. Well, what if you want to make flexible solar cells? What does that surface have to look like on a microscopic scale? Well, it's a pleating system, right? And so these guys who are brilliant at engineering and coming up with the coded cathodes and figuring out how this stuff works don't understand surface design. So they need to talk to people that make paper engineering. They need to talk to people on textile design. And there's an amazing point right now where this crossover is starting to happen. Um, it's talked about a lot, but it's rare that it actually happens and it's starting to happen. Um, so these are some various cleaning systems I've been working on with them, and then also I'm working with this group in Germany out of Freiburg that is a solar cell hotbed there, and they're interested in microsystems engineering. I was there last summer doing a talk uh, and working with their researchers. Um, I showed them one book for them, and it's going to be, I'm offering a paper now in German, which is awesome to make. Um, and it's, it's based on a book from I have that becomes a microscopic aperture for optics devices, right? Why not? Um, these smart cleaning systems. Um, what's nice about working with these scientists is I can take what I do with them and bring it back to my own studio and make art from it. I'm not so much concerned with it uh, being illustrative or being something that is representative of scientific principles, but something that can be a catalyst for art making or design or installation. Uh, excuse me, I work with an artist, uh, architect named Dennis Dollins. I started uh, with him a few years ago. I met him at the Seagraph Conference, which is a nerd conference I encourage you all to go to. Um, then it's digitally gross architecture, he's, he's a genius. Um, and he, you know, our some residents sitting next to each other, we started this conversation, what if we could make a shell for a building that could move? And he wanted me to make this cleaning system that curve, and I said, I don't know if I know how to do that. And I sent him this, this AutoCAD file a few weeks later, I was like, I think this works, you know, maybe. If you plead, and then map, full valley, full, I showed him how to do it. And then like two weeks later, I get this image back from Barcelona, like, let's make a house. Okay. <laughs> right? Why not? Um, but using paper as a deployable structure, as a collapsible architectural surface, is nothing terribly new. On the left, we have the great privilege of seeing Tim Brown from IDEO speed the penny stamps on Thursday. This is IDEO's uh, collapsible shelter here. On the right, head structures. Um, something that ships flat, but was to disaster relief. You can house people, why not? It's all rooted in paper. This is a group in Germany called Cut and Fold. They're folding plastics like it was paper. New technologies are very enabling these things. I saw this, it blew my mind. This is a group out of China. Um, this is an origami stent. What this is is based on a origami water bomb design. It's made out of paper here, but it's actually made out of microscale of metal. It goes into a clog or a class artery, claps, opens up, loves blood flow. This happens. Um, getting back to myself, this was my thesis piece at Cranbrook. Um, it's a 13 foot robotic paper. Construction is a tiny motor down here. Uh, it's got a power windows motor with a Lego's Mindstorm brain inside of it. Um, I have a video of it running, so you can see how it moves. Oh, a little choppy. It's not that choppy in real life. <laughs> well, I'll show it to you in real life. I don't have to scale them, but I have a smaller version. Um, it started two small fires in the gallery. Um, my entire second year was trying to figure out and understand robotics. Um, which was a challenge, let's just say. Uh, but it moved in syncopation in response to a viewer's participation, so you came close to this thing, it would move. Uh, it scared children. <laughs> <laughs> when I was working on this, I was working with 
scientist looking at protein misfolding. And though this is not representational of protein misfolding, um, some of the ideas therein were the start, start point of this. Uh, similar version I recreated uh, at Washington a few years later. You walk in the gallery, you're confronted with this scene, and then this happens. <laughs> Um, the latest iteration, this was at Art Prize in Grand Rapids. It finished in the top 3% that I gave a mic for. <laughs> um, but again, it worked. There was a few robotics involved. Um, this is the Arduino motor I built on the left. It worked. Yeah, fantastic. This on the right is Bob Stack from the A2 Mech Shop. <laughs> All right, here we go. Bob Stack is my, my dear friend, best friend right now. And well, he came and built this bomb, basically, and it was the same move. Um, if you guys are interested, artists out there, A2MechShop, I think it's .com, is that right, George? Yeah. Okay, A2MechShop.com, they have artists in residency programs. If you want to work with dudes that understand robotics, talk to these guys, they're going to look at mine. They love working with us. Um, this is just a video of how this thing moved. I'll leave this here, it's kind of hypnotic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one part of my practice I didn't talk too much about was teaching. I love teaching. These are some of my students at the School of Art and Design. This is inner critique. This is not a stage photograph. I want to emphasize that. They're working on modular unit studies here. Loving life. This is my class of paper engineers. Look at how happy he is. <laughs> I teach classes all the time. This is a workshop from Hollanders. This was an amazing workshop. It was all grandmas, and they loved it. Um, this was some of my uh, older student work. We make pop-up books on the right. Uh, it's a man-eater. Everybody's a spread. This is a mythological creature with a woman on its head. The guy comes close and eats it. Uh, we had a kite flying festival. We made paper kites. Here's some of my kite flyers. This is my giant Taiwan kite. It barely flew. That was terrible. It, it was, everyone was making us all look bad over there. Um, these are some of my studios. I like showing these images because um, oftentimes people think the work is very spartan, so I must be a very clean person. Not the case. This was my studio at Alfred. This was in the ceramics area. Everything has a layer of clay dirt. Clay doesn't all over it. This little square right here is where I used to work. <laughs> um, this was my studio at Cranbrook. A little bit better, not much better. Uh, this is my current studio. This is Lily the Cat. Um, a little bit better, not perfect yet. And then last, this is my studio at the Dharma Initiative in Ann Arbor. <laughs> 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 